We first saw this Archipelago 47 back in September where it was making its world debut at the Southampton Boat Show and it was a fantastically popular boat with the visitors and it's very easy to see why. It uses the input of Hamble-based Chartwell Marine. They've got a very profound heritage in commercial vessels and you absolutely see that here. It's built entirely from aluminium on the Isle of Wight. It's got lovely raised hull sides. It's got this beautiful sort of warship style inverted screen and a very sunken kind of roof line that gives it some real potency in terms of its profile. And that kind of makes sense because the owner of the uh, company, Steve Weatherly, well he's a big fan of boats like Fleming and Nordhaven for their ability to cruise through rough seas and keep you safe, but he wanted something that could do that but also go a little bit faster because he wants to jet out to a beach and enjoy a picnic with his sons and then jet back without having to spend all day doing that. And that's what this boat is all about. Now, of course, we were unable to test its seagoing credentials alongside the pontoon in Southampton. So we're delighted that today, down at Ocean Village Marina, we got the chance to take her out and give her a proper test. And we're gonna do exactly that right now. Now the first and most obvious thing to talk about is this seat. It got a little bit of abuse in the feedback uh, after that video in Southampton and I really cannot see why. It's a beautiful piece of equipment from Alu Design in Norway. It's fantastically comfortable, it looks very cool and it's adjustable in all kinds of ways. You can spin it right round. You've also got this lovely heavy duty fold down footrest that you can adjust with a finger trigger on that side of the seat. Uh, we've also got a trigger here that enables you to angle uh, the backrest. It also go up and down and we've got this that looks like it's to uh, test your blood pressure but actually that's a, a little lumbar device. It enables you to inflate the lumbar to give yourself extra support in the lower back and of course we've got um, adjustable armrests as well so it's a beautiful piece of equipment and I very much enjoy it. Now if I jump in there I imagine the nature of the problem most people had with the seat was the fact that it doesn't appear to interact that closely with a lot of the controls. But you can't really consider that boat in this way. For a start, this is boat number one. This is a prototype. This is a test platform. Steve Weatherly, the boss, is entirely aware of that, so he's using it as a test platform. He's using it as a prototype so that he can improve the ergonomics for the future. And good for him. That's what you should be doing with boat number one. Now, in terms of the controls, we have a wheel down here at a very low level just to the left of the throttles and obviously if you're sitting back in the chair you can't necessarily reach forward uh, in any way comfort and use that. But the principle of course is that when, you, when you're not uh, using autopilot you stand yourself up and actively helm the boat from the standing position which is very comfortable. We'll see that we also have uh, a power steering system. <coughs> now very clearly this shouldn't be mounted uh, on the port side of the helm because that's a little bit confusing. But we do have green and red to indicate which way you're actually steering. But the principle is that that will be mounted on the seat itself alongside autopilot controls. And with those two controls integrated into the seat, this would be a fantastic place to sit for long passages. And that is a fact. Now, if we look at the other controls here, we've also got a little iPad here and we've got a view of the engine rooms, that's good to see, but this is not some um, super expensive marine specific uh, solution, just a couple of cameras linked to the Wi-Fi, displayed on the iPad and it works an absolute treat. Now the other bone of contention I would have thought on boat number one, for a lot of people who saw it at the show and who saw our walk around review, would have been this part, which is of course very distinctly elevated, so much so that it kind of obscures about eight inches of the screen forward and to port. But this is a 24 inch plotter. 
And the idea uh, that Steve's working with is to drop that level and to use two separate 12 inch plotters. Uh, and in that configuration, it would work significantly better, I think. So let's get her underway and see how she performs. Now we'll start off using the conventional wheel rather than the power steering. We've got those throttles synced. Now this boat uses a pair of Iveco N67s. That's a 6.7 litre block, six cylinder, producing 450 horsepower each. And as you can hear, it, 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 they're fairly vocal but there's a couple of uh, provisos that ought to be considered when we're looking at the decibel readings we're getting here. Um, firstly, there were no silencers fitted to this prototype boat because they wanted to see exactly uh, what the 450s could do. Uh, secondly, because they wanted to get it to the show on time, the insulation in the engine rooms is not as high spec or as uh, comprehensive as it will be on future production models. And in terms of vibration, well, they've got a four-bladed props on this. They've got a pair of four-bladed props um, alongside the skeg. So the principle is that if they can add five-bladed props instead of the four-bladers, then although they might generate a little bit of extra drag, they'll also be less in the way of vibration. It'll be much smoother progress. Either way, though, it's not particularly intrusive, particularly for an aluminium boat. I'm quite content with the noise levels. And the pickup's pretty decent, too. We're hitting 10 knots in about 4 seconds, 20 knots in about uh, 14 seconds, and the top end of about 24 and a half knots, 25 knots. Apparently they've had 25 and a half knots out of it, but it's been sitting in the water for four months, getting slightly bearded, uh, so there's a bit of extra drag. We get to the top end of about 24 or 24 and a half knots in about uh, 19 seconds or so, so that's a bit quicker than I anticipated. What is, as I anticipated, is the ride quality. I mean it's so stable that the tracking is absolutely bang on of course and with that elevated bridge deck all the way aft, I mean even at the, uh, the stern that bridge deck uh, is still a good three and a bit feet above water level which on a 47, 48 foot boat is exactly as you would have it. And we see a lot of Catamarans now, power cats hitting the market, going for that extra internal volume and stability and space and efficiency. But more often than not, they'll use that bridge deck for accommodation and drop it low. So that interacts with water shapes, it slows you down, it makes you more sluggish, it creates high pressure zones forward that kick spray up and cover your foredeck or even in some cases your flybridge. So this is nice, this is soft riding, this is stable, this is pretty efficient too. Even though this is a relatively high powered option for this boat with twin 450s, you can actually go up to the twin 570s apparently, uh, but you can also go as low as a pair of 120s for real distance. We're still getting anywhere between 12 and 18 knots, we're still getting round about 4 litres per nautical mile, and that is very impressive indeed, particularly as in the standard fit out here we've got a pair of two, uh, sorry, a pair of 1,000 litre fuel tanks totaling 2,000 litres of course. And because of the construction method that they use in these hulls, there's plenty of space to extend those, to double them in fact. So you could use a pair of 2,000 litre fuel tanks. And if you're only drinking four litres per nautical mile, it's very clear that it's a serious, serious long distance potential. And what we'll do is activate this. Now it would obviously be more intuitive if it was in front of me or on the seat. But now you see, if I want to go to starboard, it gets much, much more in the way of action. And we turn it at a good rate, peeling out a little bit, not greatly, not so greatly that you feel the need to actually grip onto things to stop yourself sliding sideways. And visibility all around, you know, in spite of this uh, elevated helm, remains very, very good indeed. They're pretty fine entry these holes, so you do feel like you're kind of wave piercing, you're like you're kind of sli slicing through those swells rather than elevating the bow with too much buoyancy and then coming back down. I mean we don't really have much in the way of a sea state today to really test her out and that's a shame. But we will throw her about as best we can, we'll pop over to port now 
Now that's me hard over at maximum speed. And you can see how serene and easy that is. Very relaxed indeed. I would, I think, enjoy the idea of twin helm seats up here and an inward facing uh, bench on the starboard side. But of course, as an aluminium boat, this is very much a boat that can be built to your spec. It's not full custom, I wouldn't say, but certainly they're receptive to any ideas you might have about rearranging furniture, uh, both inside and in that uh, big aft cockpit. Now, while we're out here, we're going to make best use of our time on the way back into Ocean Village to have a little look around at the external decks. And the aft cockpit in particular is really genuinely interesting. I mean, for a start, this is a 47 foot boat and what we have here is a beam of about 21 foot three. Now, that's pretty large. That's about 45% of the boat's overall length. Um, so even by cat standards, that's pretty decent. But if you compare it to other boats in the cat market, recent boats like the Prestige M48, well, it's about one foot eight, one foot ten wider than that. And if you look at something that's more directly comparable, perhaps like the Vandal Explorer, it's seven foot wider in the beam than that Explorer cat, that aluminium cat. In terms of the way they've used the space, well, we've got access on either side, of course, to the engine rooms inside those holes. There's loads of space in there, and when we get back alongside, we'll have a look and a little chat about that. We also have freestanding furniture just down here, which isn't currently rigged, of course, because we're out on the water. But as it's aluminium, as you're not working with fixed moulds, you can, of course, build all sorts of um, proper integrated furniture into the back of this pilot house just here. Um, dinettes and seating areas and so on, sunbathing pads if necessary. And further aft, well at the moment on this prototype boat, in spite of the fact that we've got quite an open transom and a gate on the port side, there's really nowhere sensible to get back in from the water or to board if you're boating in the Mediterranean and you're more stern too. So what they're going to do on future models is integrate some steps that go down to low level uh, swim platforms that extend the uh, overall length by perhaps three feet. That'll make it much more usable, much more sensible for Mediterranean boating. In the meantime, what we have is a pair of these side gates, one on either side to board from the side. And that's uh, pretty easy with a set of steps. They're quite elevated. Um, they're not beautifully done as yet, as you can see. There's no catches. Um, and the finish ain't great, and there's a bit of a gap. It's just a bit of a mess, that part of this boat at the moment, so that's one of the areas that needs tidying up. But what I do like, aside from all the space down in these engine rooms, is the space inside the upper part of the hulls. Now, on the back end of the pilot house, if I just take you over here, we've got a good size of kind of walk-in locker with a light, and this is ideal because it's drained. This is absolutely ideal for your wetsuits and your lines and your fenders, all your wet stuff that you want to hang up so it can dry, keep it out of uh, harm's way. And inside the steps up onto those side decks, we also have some really tremendous capacity, again, for big bulbous roving fenders and the like. And this is uh, the same on the other side of the boat, of course. So in terms of seamanship gear, in terms of wet gear, uh, there's loads of space to stow that away. Now if we walk up those steps onto these profoundly elevated side decks, clearly, in addition to providing the storage aft, these are designed to create loads of vertical height down below inside those holes for the accommodation. And in fact, as I peek down through this uh, little hatch, I can see a bed down there, I can see the windows looking out, and it looks pretty spacious. Now this is a lovely wide side deck. <coughs> Very easy to make your way around, particularly with this uh, roof rack on top there. Now of course, on a cat, on a beamy cat like this, one of the key areas that you want to investigate is 
the roof. Now this is a big platform in its own right up here and as an aluminium manufacturer you look at it and you think well there's all kinds of things you can do with this. As it stands of course we've got this big roof rack and that's easily big enough for all kinds of toys uh, and tenders. You could whack your stand up paddle boards, your kayaks up here, your sea kayaks, 13 footers and so on, no trouble at all and you could easily fit enough up there for the whole family. But it's more likely if you're using this for long passages that you'll use this upper deck for solar panels. You might also use it for a proper tender and also a crane. Again, there's plenty of space up there for that. And if you don't intend to use it for any of that, then it's perfectly possible that you could integrate proper sunroofs into here to introduce a bit more natural light down below. Now, at the Southampton Boat Show, there was speculation they were going to use this uh, model, the 47, as a basis for a 47 fly model as well. Um, and they even had preliminary drawings of that. But it seems that that is not going to happen. That's a bit of a shame, I think. On the plus side though, there's a 52, a larger 52 model coming out and that will have a fly option. So they're going to reserve this as the kind of rough, tough, offshore distance making machine with its 8mm uh, plate on the hulls and its 6mm top sides. The rest of the range, the 40, the new 52 and the new 63, they will have 6mm uh, hull plates and 5mm top sides and they will enable you to enjoy other kinds of recreation such as the flybridge on the 52 but for me on the 47 a bit of a shame we're not going to see a flybridge up here because I think it would have transformed its uh, recreational usability. Up on the foredeck the fact that this boat is more about seamanship practicalities than it is about outright recreational versatility again makes itself evident. So as I mentioned on a lot of boats you'd have the bridge deck dipping way low to really maximise that internal volume to generate loads of space for your accommodation. They haven't done that here. There's tremendous clearance here, but as you move further aft, that remains at sort of three to four foot, which is really generous on a boat of around 47 foot seven inches. And when you're underway, I mean, we've been going through our own wakes because they're pretty much the only swells we can find today, but some of those have been pretty sizable. We've done so at pace. We've done so while um, healing through a corner. Not once have we felt those wave shapes even slightly interfere with our bridge deck. So they've done a pretty good job here, and though we can't find any major swells, it kind of supports the notion that this is designed and built as a proper offshore boat. OK, now I think it's time to get out of this freezing spring breeze and put myself inside the saloon, which, if I recall correctly, from the Southampton Boat Show, is a really impressive place to be. Now when you get in here, one of the most surprising elements is the headroom. I mean, we must have, what, about six foot eight, I reckon, up there, and that's in spite of that beautiful low-slung roof line. Now obviously, because we don't have use of a low-slung bridge deck as well, we don't have that extra volume for accommodation, we have relatively elevated uh, sideboards and furniture on both sides of this saloon to help generate extra space and headroom down in those cabins in either hull. So it does kind of pinch in your saloon beam. But we've still got, I reckon, I've just measured it with my laser measure, we've still got around about eight or nine feet of width in here to play with. And that's pretty well used. Uh, on the port side, we've got nice big fridge and freezer, full height. Nice high capacity. We've also got a little dehumidifier in there. And by the way, this, um, this wood, it seems as lovely to me now as it did when we were at the boat show. This is a, um, uh, an oak-faced uh, marine ply, and it's, it's really beautifully lacquered. It's got a kind of white pigment in the lacquer, so it feels really natural, looks superb. Bounces the light around, but it's not in any way glossy. It's slightly sort of somewhere between matte and satin. It looks superb, really modern, really Nordic feeling. Ahead here, we've got an L-shaped uh, dining area that looks across to the galley. Uh, now, as things stand, I don't think, no, there's no storage built into there yet, but there will be, and that'll be pretty handy because, of course, none of this stuff on either side can be used for storage because it generates that volume down below in the holes. So this will be a nice touch when that's uh, been upgraded and we have proper storage inside these seat bases, that'll be useful. And I think they're also looking at increasing the width of these cushions to make them plusher and also giving it a bit of an angle because at the moment it's quite vertical. Now on the other side from that donette 
we have a really impressive galley. And that again is L-shaped. The height of it is tremendous. I talked about this at the show too. It's so rare you see um, a galley or a kitchen with sufficient work height that it's comfortable for a six footer. Usually where it's down here, you kind of have to stoop. And we're going over some handy weights now, look. And if your, your, your back is just taking extra impacts as you're stooping over, it's, uh, it causes a, a fair bit of pain um, over long distances. So this is great. And it also enables the fact that they've um, elevated this uh, worktop means that in spite of using this lower section for that extra volume down in the starboard hull, you still have space for some nice soft close drawers. Again, that's beautiful quality and seems to be yeah grain matched all the way down which is lovely and these do come op open at um, sea when you bounce around a little bit so they're not a uh, flawless solution but again it's a prototype boat steve's very much looking into a solution for that now what else do we have here we have a tv facing across we have a cooker built in there below the level of the worktop we have an integrated stainless steel sink um, beyond that, not a huge amount, but it's just a very attractive place to be. As I say, if you want to use that uh, roof for something other um, than just the roof rack or the solar panels or the tender or the crane, then you could factor in additional natural light with overhead sunroofs. But what's quite useful here, because this is not necessarily a boat that excels with storage, the fact that the helm station is up about, I'd say, six inches from the main saloon. Well, they're going to extend that level further aft, and that will generate additional space. So you've got under deck space between this kind of level and that bridge deck. So that will be a really handy upgrade. And also, the fact that they're going to lift this by six inches means that when you sit down on the dinette, at the moment, you don't see a great deal. You only just see you don't see the sea, you just see the horizon pretty much, so the view's not as, it, as good as it could be. You elevate yourself six inches and all of a sudden you've got big sea views all around, so that'll be a really, really positive change. But actually, much as I like this space, my favourite region of this boat, though usually on a proper catamaran, a proper power cat, it's a flawed region of the boat, my favourite region of this particular power cat is down here in the port hole where you find the owner's cabin. Now I've always said that if I had a million quid or so to spend on a boat I would be a deeply selfish owner. You know, these holes they could each be split into three so you've got a forward cabin, an aft cabin and a central section with a heads and shower compartment. But on this boat, exactly as I would have it, the entire port hole is given over to the needs of the owner. Now the headrooms as good as we suspected, even over here, underneath this bit of uh, port furniture by that L-shaped dinette. It's still six foot one. I mean, if that's the most critical pinch point in this port hull, you've got to be pretty impressed with that. What I really love, though, is the elegance of the space. We have a fore and aft bed at the back end here. It's surrounded by this lovely dark blue sort of matte vinyl and this beautiful uh, satin walnut. And there's a fantastic sculptural feel to this. It really is a lovely contrast. It feels magnificent. And what I really love are these. I mean from down here at bed level it just couldn't be better. Can you imagine waking up to this? Huge plunging windows directly ne next to you. I mean if you're in relatively rough seas you're gonna see a little bit of green water coming over there as well. It really is magnificent. I absolutely love that. Now there's no storage under this bed at the moment, because as I say, it's a prototype, but it will come up on ramps and there'll be pretty generous storage under there. And if we move a little bit further forward, we'll see there's a kind of corner here with power sockets and a stall. Well, this is going to be a little office unit or a dressing table. Uh, it's an ideal sort of space for that. And again, the fit out is very nice indeed, in spite of the fact that it's a very early boat, little alcoves for your bits and bobs, your knickknacks on either side. I mean, on a mono hole, you might think, well, that's uh, not ideal. Things are going to spill out of there. But this is a very stable boat, as it's shown to be today. We also have some nice little leather handles on these doors here. I mean, look inside, and you see that, again, there's some finishing to be done. What I really like, though, is up here in the forwardmost part. 
Now here you can see the hull is really tapering, but we've got such tremendous length. We've got a proper rain shower up here in the shower, plus another handheld unit, and there's easily space for you and your partner, for two people to shower together in the morning. It's a wonderful space with really spectacular views. I mean, it might make me sound like a bit of an anorak. Perhaps you'd prefer to look at the horizon and boats and sunshine and things. But if you peer through this window, you get to look across at the other hull and see those fine forward edges slicing into the water. I mean, I could, I could just look at that all day. But again, headroom is very good, the light is very good, it's beautifully arranged, and we've also got a decent bit of storage in here too, underneath this sink. Now, on the other side of the boat, we have a more conventional, if slightly less glamorous layout. Now at the show, it wasn't quite finished, so we'll pop straight over now and see what progress has been made there. Ah, well, when we step down in here, I'm actually, in a way, perversely quite pleased to see that absolutely no progress has been made. So what we have is basically the skin, the structure, the substance of the boat. Now in this forwardmost part, this is perfectly set up to be a uh, bunk cabin. Again, they've got pretty decent views across to that uh, other hull, which is nice, plus good light above. and. In the aft part of this cabin, there's also going to be a floor-to-ceiling cupboard, and that's where your washing machine and dryer will go. But there's not a great deal else to look at in here, so what we'll do is move slightly further aft on a boat at sea that's rocking around a little, and I'll pop straight in here. Cheers, Paul. And have a look at this space. Now, this is the central heads and shower compartment. Again, it's a good, good length running fore and aft. There's loads of space here for a separate shower, for a toilet forward, uh, a sink in the middle. It's pretty impressive. Again, loads of headroom. And, it, you know, having it between the two cabins, even though they have to share that, I and mean, it's a great way to give people natural privacy, to, to naturally divide the two cabins off from one another. And if we head further aft, you'll see that if you do spec the boat like this, there's a bit more engine noise in this side because, again, the insulation is uh, less complete than it is in the port hull. But in this particular cabin, you come through there, I'll just hold the door for you. You'll see that it pretty much mirrors what we've got in the aft part of the owner's cabin. So you've got a slightly lower section under the uh, galley there. We've got three massive windows to give your VIP guest a real treat. And this will be rigged either as a double or as a twin, and you'll be able to convert it between one and the other very simply. And in another nod to the intelligence of this design, you'll see that the fuel tank is positioned on the inner side of the hull, so that if you get any accidents, it's protected, it's distant from that point of impact. Well, we're back alongside, and as promised, we've ducked down into the uh, engine bays, this is the uh, port hull, the port engine, and despite the fact that this is pretty much the largest engine you can spec with this boat, as you can see, the space is absolutely enormous. There's loads of space down here for various other things. I mean, we've got the domestic batteries over there, uh, but we've got tremendous space here for your water maker, for a dive compressor if you want it, for your generator. Um, and if we climb up into the other hull, actually, you'll see that there's actually a generator already fitted in there. Let's have a little look. It's a Fisher Panda generator. It's just uh, stowed down here um, inboard of the ladder. Again, masses of space. <clears throat> so much space, in fact. Now, I've been talking to Steve. We've been talking about the uh, storage facilities on this boat, um, and he's got plans um, in action right now to um, kind of halve the access point to these engine rooms such that in the aft section he could fit a whole load of aluminium shelving and storage boxes so you've got plenty more space to stow your gear on both uh, sides and then simply shift the generator forward. As I say there's plenty of space for that and once they're all properly insulated because as you can see 
uh, we mentioned earlier it uh, could do with a little more attention in that regard. Um, he's also thinking of shifting the various water pumps back here so that when you're running those systems they don't kind of intrude on your day in that saloon. This Archipelago 47 then is pretty much exactly as I hoped it might be when I first saw it at the Southampton Boat Show. It's very soft riding, it's very efficient, it's very capable, very easy to drive. It really looks after you, it feels beautifully built and it looks fantastic. It's not one of those cats that like so many others on the modern market is trying to appear to be a monohull. It's not using those design cues, it knows what it is. It's a proper wide beam offshore cat and that's the way it looks and that's the way I like it. I'm a bit disappointed that there's no flybridge option on this boat um, because that would really open up its recreational versatility. But like I say, the point of this boat in this range now, this four strong range, is to be the proper hardcore offshore boat. And I think the indication suggests to me that it's pretty much going to succeed in that regard. Now, it goes from 1.2 million pounds plus VAT, or for this particular boat, this prototype, 975,000 pounds plus VAT. The only reason I might have any qualms about that is the fact that the bigger 52 in non-fly version goes from about 1.35 million plus VAT. And as a base package, including that flybridge, the 52 goes from 1.5 million pounds plus VAT. And that seems to me like a very exciting proposition, but that's a story for another time. As things stand, this Archipelago 47 does everything I wanted it to do. And yeah, it's not quite finished yet, but once it is, it's gonna be a seriously, seriously compelling proposition. Thank you.